worshipful adorations to the sacred spiritual presence of the beloved and worshipful Holy Master Guru Maharaj Sri Swami Sat Shirananda, into whose presence and proximity you are all fortunate enough to draw near day by day, morning after morning, to start the day in as sublime and perfect a way as it is possible to start it. Prata Smarami, Prata Bajami, Prata Namami. I remember thee, early morning. I worship thee, early morning. I bow down to thee, early morning. With these words, several of the hymns of salutations and adorations, several of the well-known slokas of Adi Shankaracharya begin, so much so that this triplet of verses has become to be known as the Pratasmarami Stotra. What is the speciality about praying early in the morning, worshipping God early in the morning? Mahatma Gandhi in Sabaramati Ashram as well as Sevagram used to hold their morning prayers when it was still semi-dark. There is a reason. There is a speciality in this early morning hour. Start the day with God, they say. And very shrewdly, with a touch of humour, there is also a saying, the early bird catches the worm. Which means it pays dividends to be early. The earlier you are up, the more time you have. The more time you have, the less hurried you are. The less under pressure you are. The less under pressure you are, the less tension, which is better for your health, your heart, your blood pressure, your entire nervous system, even your digestion. This is the pragmatic reason. If you are up early, you have greater leisure. If you are not up early, you are more hard-pressed for time. And it is not good to start a day being pushed for time. But what is the higher meaning? The higher meaning is that it is a period when your consciousness is in the most suitable condition to receive higher impulses from the inner world of the spirit, the divine world. Your consciousness is most sensitive as well as receptive, your inner antakarana, the normal human consciousness which you exercise during your active hours of waking, is in a most calm and sattvic condition at this hour. This is conducive to introspection and prayerfulness. For when you are fully awake and have started to move in this world, your entire mind is outgoing. It is completely drawn into the world of the many, into the field of names and forms, ever-changing activities. So it is completely occupied and caught up, dominated by the visible, the outer, the material, the phenomenon. Therefore, it is not available to receive higher impulses, unless it has been trained to receive them even in this state of being completely drawn out. Then, too, that same mind, when it is caught in a deep sleep, is totally unreceptive and completely closed to all higher impulses, sublime divine impulses. But in the early dawn, the Antakarana is freed from the tamas of sleep and is still yet free from the domination of rajas of the outer world, the compulsions and impulsions that catch it and draw it. Draw it into this very hectic field of many tasks to be done, many people to see, the very diverse types of thought forms to see, in which the mind is required to be engaged and involved in. So, you are free in this interim period from both the handicaps of sleep as well as the shortcomings and involvements of the fully awakened state. Here, therefore, is a period of openness, of receptivity, of sattva, a period most suitable, most propitious, when you can give yourself a lift and enter into God. And that sets the entire tone for the whole day. If in this way you start the day with God, you start with pratasmarami, pratabhajami, pratanamami, and then the whole day is beautifully qualified with this bath, 
this attitude of prostration, this attitude of open heart, of worship, of remembrance. And that is the secret of being in the world and yet abiding in God, being in Kriya, in action, and yet inwardly there is a center of silence, Nishkriya, without action. A mystical poet has beautifully given to us in brief this little secret of the right way of starting one's day, so that one reaps a golden harvest of fullest benefit from this charming, this wonderful, this magic period of the early dawn. I met God in the morning, when my day was of its best, and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long the presence lingered, all day long he stayed with me, and we sailed in perfect calmness over a very troubled sea. So I think I know the secret learned from many a troubled way. You must seek him in the morning if you want him through the day. Ralph Cushman. Thus, it is that there is a very special quality, a very special state of consciousness prevailing in this interim period between the disadvantages of both sleep and awakeness. Both are necessary, but both contain obstacles in total communion, inner communion with the Spirit, the Supreme. I have a great joy in sharing with you, therefore, this secret of why our ancients said prata smarami, prata bhajami, prata namami, because they knew this secret, this inner yogic secret, the mystical secret of the state of consciousness that the individual possesses in this early morning dawn hour. It sets the tone for the entire day. And then you live with God, you move with God, you sail the troubled sea of vyavaharic life with perfect calmness and serenity because God is with you. You do the sailing with God as your companion. May we benefit ourselves fully from this golden hour and make each day a further ascent towards the great goal, attaining which you become blessed. May you all become blessed. And then I thought I would give a little talk on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. A little talk. The yoga teachers for people that want to know a little bit more about yoga. The first sutra of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali starts off with Atha Yoganusasanam, Sanskrit, meaning now the exposition of yoga is being made. But what is the meaning of this yoga? Because yoga comes from the Sanskrit word yuj, which comes from the bridle that the horse wears around its neck in order to connect it with that which it is drawing behind, the cart, the chariot. And it has come to mean union. But what is this union? What is this yoga that they are talking about in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali? This yoga is an integration of your physical body, the cart, with your emotional body, the reins, with your mental body, the mind, with your spirit, along the length of the anta karana, to the soul, to the monad, the group soul, to the logos, the spirit in charge of this planet, to the whole universe, to Atman, the center of the central spiritual universes. And yoga, the word yoga means you are that, tat tvam asi. You are that. You are a consciousness that can exist at any point upon that line. 
And it says, now, after all that, here are complete instructions on enlightenment, because that indeed is the meaning of the word yoga. It's not just hatha yoga. It's not just bhakti yoga. It's not just karma yoga. It's not just raja yoga. It's not all these various ladders that take you from here to enlightenment. Yoga itself is enlightenment. And it says, after all that, here are complete instructions on how to become enlightened. And what does it mean by, after all that? Because, after all that, is a very special place to be. It means that you have done a lot. You have been through many lifetimes. You have entered into every activity that is available on this planet and you have found that none of these activities will take you towards happiness. You have given up with money. You have given up with houses. You have given up with books. You have given up with boyfriends and husbands. You have given up with girlfriends and wives. You've given up with gold. Because after all that, you know that you are born alone. After all that, you know that you will die alone. And you must seek your own emancipation by yourself. It's very hard to understand that above hell, Dante Alighieri wrote, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. You have lost hope that anything can give you that happiness. Friendship, people, places, sunshine, everything has a drawback. And you begin to understand in the end that no matter what the outside circumstances are, the only thing that is going to make you happy is you. Because it also means, after all that, here are complete instructions on how to be happy. And in a way, there is no way to learn how to be happy except to know that by connection with God, you are that happiness. And if you are not happy, nobody is happy. You have to know that just being in that state of union, just being in that state of connection, you are happiness. You are enlightened. You are connected. You are a made man. The Sufis have this phrase about the made man, a person who has been unified, a person who has been integrated, by taking an unformed man, not a made man, an unformed man into the presence of the wise, is like throwing a dead dog into a pool of rose water. Because the unformed person is painful, is filled with negative energy is filled with blockages that prevent him from that union, that connection, that happiness. So, this very small phrase at the beginning of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali says, unless you have experienced that hopelessness, unless you know that nothing else is going to give you happiness, it is absolutely pointless to start with the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Because you still have hope that something else is going to give you that happiness you seek. And perhaps you need to enter into all those states to find out that it is hopeless. Only that removal of the blockages 
that prevent enlightenment is going to make you happy. And when you reach up to the second sutra of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, it says, Yogas Chitta Vritti Niroda. It means yoga, enlightenment, comes through chitta, the pure mind, the mind containing within it the emotions, the mind containing within it all the chakras, the mind containing within it the physical body. And chitta is a purified spiritual body. Chitta is the Holy Grail, the Sangreal, the cup which is empty, the cup which has no ego, no thinking that it knows anything. There's a very beautiful story from a Zen master, and the governor of the promise comes to see the Zen master, and he comes and sits down, and he starts to tell him about his wonderful library. And he starts to tell him about his spiritual experiences. And he starts to tell the Zen master about what a wonderful life he has with his beautiful clothes and his 400 concubines. And the master said, shall we have a cup of tea? One of the students of the master brought a beautiful Chinese cup of tea with many cups. And he placed the cups on the table. And he placed the teapot on the table. And the master picked up the teapot and he started to pour a cup of tea for the governor of the province. And as he poured, the cup filled. And as it filled, it started to overflow the rim of the cup onto the table beneath. And the master kept pouring and pouring. And the governor of the province said, Stop, stop. That is too much. And the master said to the governor of the province, you are like that cup. You are too full. You need to go and empty yourself through meditation so that I can fill your cup with the energy of the divine. I can fill your cup with the energy of enlightenment because whilst you are full, there is no room for me. And this is the meaning of chitta. Chitta is an empty cup. It is a purified mind. It is a mind which has no thoughts. Chitta vritti niroda. Vrittis are the thought forms, the blockages, the energy blockages, the angry negative emotions with which the cup is filled. Another name for these vrittis is the selfish competitive ego, that which thinks it knows, that which is satisfied that which is happy existing on this planet without any thought of that death which is to come. Niroda, bringing those vrittis down to zero, removing the vrittis, dissolving the vrittis, dissolving the energy blockages, removing them totally from your mind, removing the ego, the selfish, competitive ego from your mind. And it says union comes when you have removed all of those blockages. Union comes, enlightenment comes, happiness comes, when all of those painful energies that exist within you have been dissolved, and only the purified chitta, the purified mind, exists, the empty cup, the cup which is receptive. The cup which can be filled with the energies from the higher spheres. We were talking previously about what is in a name. Every Sanskrit name has meaning. It has something to move towards. For example, Sat, Chid, Ananda comes from the Sanskrit words sattva, truth, citta, a purified mind, empty cup, ananda, bliss, the energy that descends from above and fills the empty cup 
with the blood of Christ. Same meaning as the Holy Trinity. Same meaning as the Father, who art in heaven, the Son, that which exists on this planet, the empty cup, and the Holy Spirit, Ananda, bliss, energy which descends. Quality of God is not constrained by anything. It drops as the gentle dew, the gentle rain, upon its place beneath. It is twice blessed, first by he who gives, Father, Sattvas, the truth, that which is unchangeable, because anything which can change cannot be called true. There's nothing on this planet which does not change. Even the mountains are worn away over many millions of years. Everything is changeable. The body changes from young to old, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The emotions change from minute to minute, from anger to sadness, sadness to joy, joy to sympathy. Everything changes. The mind changes like a mad monkey jumping from tree to tree. I want this, I want that, I want the other. Come here, you mum. <laughs> The only thing which does not change is the access to the higher energies. Those energies which fill our cup and our cup runneth over. Yogas, chitta, vritti, niroda. Yoga comes when we have removed all of our blockages. Happiness comes when we have got rid of all of those things which are not us when we have proved that we are in charge. Our selfishness is not in charge. Our wanting is not in charge. Our competitive nature is not in charge. Our ego is not in charge. The only thing which is in charge is you. Not that you which does not exist, which changes, which wants, which thinks that it can be happy through wanting. Finally, the third sutra of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. After all that, here are complete instructions on how to be happy. Happiness comes when we've removed all of our blockages and we are receptive to the energies from above. And finally, it says in the third sutra, Then the seer abides in his own nature. Tada drastu svarupe vastanam. And that seer, that thing which sees, that thing which observes, that thing which witnesses, that thing which knows the truth about every one of your modifications, every one of your changes, every one of your desires, that looks and is critical. That seer, that higher spiritual energy. Then you, because you are that seer, exist in your own true nature. And in a way, this is exactly the same meaning as the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra from Buddhism and the Third Sutra from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali mean exactly the same thing. All sages, 
for millions of years exist in prajna paramita. The heart, prajna, the heart, paramita, the highest heart, that highest heart which exists eternally, higher than the highest chakra, higher than the center of the universe, that highest heart which is you. You are that. You are that seer. You are that highest heart. This is the beautiful message of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It says here, after all that shit, here are complete instructions on how to be happy. And it says, you will never be happy by associating yourself with this body on this planet. Because this body is going to change. It's going to go. It says, connect. Only connect. with that which is unchangeable, with that which is pure, with that which exists eternally. It gives that promise of eternal life. Because you are that. You exist unchangeably. And every few years you descend into another motor car, or we can call it a body, and we get given the manual that says, put in the good fuel, <laughs> don't eat crap, look after your motor car, give it a good wash now and again, put in the good oil, put in the good petrol, don't drive it too fast. <laughs> and your motor car, That same motor car that Indiana Jones had. He said, it's not the age, it's the mileage. <laughs> because he was always running about from place to place. It's not the age, it's the mileage. How many miles have you run today? How far have you pushed yourself? Hindus say that you're only given a certain number of breaths in your life. Don't use them up too quickly. Master Pranayama. And the seer abides in his own true nature, prajna paramita, the highest heart, a heart of intuition, the heart which is not the intellect, a heart which is intuitive, which knows, rather than the mind which thinks it knows. You are not the body. You are not the emotions. You are not the mind. Immortal self thou art. And realizing that is the subject of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Complete instructions on how to be happy. And this is why it is a really good thing for everyone, for every yoga teacher to have read this beautiful tome. So you can give everybody in the whole planet complete instructions on how to be happy. This is the function of yoga. This is the function of a yoga teacher. 
to give everybody hope in the darkness, light in the darkness, the light of universal truth. The light of the angels, the light of the highest heart, which loves 100% of the time. Forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. Remember, Recuerda, die a little every day. Muere un poquitito todos los días. If you go up into the central spiritual si sun, vas al centro espiritual, you will lose vas a perder all of your earthly pain. Todos tus dolores de tierra. And although this sounds like a warning not to go too high, si bien eso es como una, un consejo no ir tan alto, to me, para mí, it's something saying, Come on up. Dice, bien, bien arriba, bien arriba. Go higher. Ve un poco más alto. Bathe. Báñate. In the energies of the higher self every day. En las energías de tu alto ser todos los días.